So this is a QDMI lecture for my class and hope for anybody else that's learning about acute MIs. So let's get started. So acute myocardial infarction or heart attack or an acute MI is um, something that we see when there is blockage to the main coronary arteries to the heart. So if we have those blockages, what happens is it impedes blood flow causing chest pain, which causes no flow or low flow of blood that decreases the oxygen carrying capacity and the blood flow to keep the tissue alive of the heart. So with a heart attack or an acute myocardial infarction, we can have ischemia, which is what that is, a swelling or um, um, irritation to that tissue, or we can have death to the tissue. And so the whole goal is to prevent that. So as you can see, this is a great picture. This is a vascular system and he's clutching his chest. One of the things that we see when people are having heart attacks. So what causes an MI or a heart attack? As you look at this picture, it really shows us a great picture of what's happening. We have a normal artery, as you can see here, a vessel. And so this artery, you see the blood is flowing through. These are the arrows it's flowing through. And if you look at it, if I cut that artery, you can see if I'm looking inside the vessel itself, you see how all the walls are intact and everything's open and everything's flowing without any issues. This is a normal vessel. So we can have mid-stage atherosclerosis, so the start. So this is where we have the cholesterol that starts to clump up. We have high cholesterol and we'll start to get plaques that will start to adhere or clump into the wall of the artery. When that happens, as you can see, the artery is coming, blood cells will get clumped up and they'll start to have to um, condense to get around it. Um, I love to use the analogy of a car wreck on a highway. If we have a car that wrecks, if you have two cars that wreck and here's your highway going, it's a three lane highway and they've taken two of the lanes, what happens to traffic? We have to start and we have to go into it, slow down, we slow down, we get into a single lane, and then we have to go around the blockage to get to the other side. And then what happens is it slows or stops traffic and causes this big issue. Well, that's the same thing with this. It's gonna slow down the red blood cell movement, causing issues to happen. And as the cholesterol increases, if we go to late stage of it, as you can see, it's going to almost close off entirely the artery. And by doing that, we're going to have just this little bit of flow of blood. And that decrease in blood flow can cause a, a lack of perfusion. It can almost completely occlude it or totally occlude it. And then we have no blood flow, no, and we have lack of oxygen to that tissue causing ischemia and then death of the tissue. So what causes this to happen? There's many things, but we can, these are the things that really play into it. Obesity, um, diabetes. We've talked about diabetes and hypertension throughout your entire journey through nursing school. These are the silent killers. Um, they wreak havoc on vessels. Um, they can scar and stress vessels by what's happening. And this is, can cause um, these things to happen in patients to have, or people to have heart attacks. Uh, stress, <laughs> I should say that like that because we're all stressed. You can see what I look like. I've been having trouble getting videos to upload and different things to happen today. It's just been very stressful. But being in nursing school is a stressor by itself, and I understand that. But stress can cause these issues to happen. One of the biggest times in the hospitals that we see heart attacks um, are during tax season and um, holidays, believe it or not. There are high stress times. We see a lot of suicide too and depression during those times. So something interesting to, to know, the, the cardiac world gets uh, busy during those times. Um, stimulants, caffeine, who doesn't love their cup of coffee? Um, I know I have students that love it and so do I. Um, tea, Coca-Cola, sodas, anything with caffeine. Even your decaffeinated beverages, I want to make a point to stay, say, have a little bit of caffeine. So we definitely need to make sure if we're talking, we don't want our client or patient to have any caffeine, to make them aware that there is a little bit of caffeine still in a decaffeinated beverage. Nicotine, we get that from smoking, and that's probably the worst thing for anybody is smoking. It causes scarring on the actual arteries in the body, this nicotine, it, it's pretty rough. So if you're smoking, you need to quit, and anybody that you know, let them know. 
because you can prevent this from happening by just taking those two things out of your lifestyle. High cholesterol, our, uh, how, what we eat, how we eat, high fatty foods, um, animal products, dairy, all of those things can play into high cholesterol levels. We can lower cholesterol through diet and we can increase cholesterol through diet. Unfortunately, there are some people out there that have um, high cholesterol based because of genetics. And those are folks that just are gonna have to take medications to lower their cholesterol. African-American males are the highest to, um, are the number one to have heart attacks and they're the number one to have high cholesterol and some of these hypertension and some of these other situations. So they really need to be on top of their health and quitting smoking, drinking alcohol, um, any kind of caffeine, watching that diet, controlling that blood pressure and sugar, and keeping the weight off by exercise. And here's a goodie, more men than women. So apparently women can really handle stress, and I do believe that to be true. So more men die of MIs or have uh, coronary issues than women. So we have angina, and this is chest pain, and we can see um, unstable angina, which we see with an acute coronary syndrome or a heart attack, or we can have stable angina or coronary artery disease. Some people have chronic angina. And this is actually the stable angina is chest discomfort or pain, and it's provoked when there's exertion. So exercise, um, different things like that, that would bring on that pain, but is alleviated with rest or with nitroglycerin. So a lot of chronic or stable angina patients will carry their own nitroglycerin. They're little tablets in a vial, it, they, it, a little um, bottle that has a cap, and it's a brown bottle because they will become, um, they will lose their potency due to light. Light breaks down nitroglycerin. So if you hang a bag, that's why you get a dark bag to put over the bag that you're hanging or the bottle that you're hanging um, in the hospitals. And the little pills always checking the expiration date because if you put it sublingual and it doesn't get a little burn under the tongue, then it might be out of date. They need to be checking those dates. Um, acute coronary syndrome is where we have unstable angina. And this is where we have chest pain. It's unpredictable. And when we sit down or anything, it does not go away. That pain remains. That is usually a sign or indicative that you're having an acute myocardial infarction or you are close to having one. It, you are in that process. This is an acute coronary syndrome and is an emergent situation. You need to be seen immediately. If you have coronary artery disease and stable angina and it goes away, you don't. But I will say this is it's always good to tell your patients to write it down and then call and follow up with their physician about stable angina. The acute coronary syndrome, ACS, unstable angina and MI, that's an immediate. Time is tissue, they need to get to the hospital, and we need to be doing something to alleviate this um, within 45 minutes of the time of onset. Now, I don't know where everybody lives, but I will say this, we live kind of out around the mountain, and you have to travel to get places. So it can take up to 45 minutes. So don't get in your car and try to drive somewhere. Definitely call 911, get EMS en route so they can either fly you or drive you and get you to where you need because time is tissue because the longer we wait, death to the heart tissue will happen. And you can survive this if we can intervene quickly. So signs and symptoms of a myocardial infarction, sudden, crushing, radiating, heavy pressure. We're feeling this pain, chest pain. This is what it feels like. It's a sudden onset. It's crushing. A lot of people say it feels like an elephant sitting on my chest. You will hear them or it feels like somebody's just put a truck on them, I've heard. Um, radiating, lots of times the classic sign is that they'll have chest pain that radiates down that left arm. That's a classic sign. Occasionally people will have deferred pain and so they can have chest pain and it'll radiate down, radiate down both arms. They can have back pain, shoulder pain, heartburn. We get a lot, I've just had non, never ending heartburn. I've been popping Tums and everything else, trying to get it to go away and that's actually a sign they could be having a heart attack. 
Um, and jaw pain, we get the classic sign of jaw pain. So that's something that we need to understand. So if we see this, we know something's going on. And the first thing, no matter what, with someone with a chest pain, no matter what's going on, if they say they're having chest discomfort or pain, you wanna get an EKG. That is the first thing you get because that is going to show us what is happening with the muscle of the heart. So we can actually, doctors and nurses can um, look at EKGs and tell what's going on. Doctors can diagnose an actual heart attack from an EKG. So that's the number one thing we wanna do. But these are some signs and symptoms. So more signs and symptoms of an MI, nausea and vomiting. Um, and it also depends on where it hits in the heart. If you have a certain part of the heart, people are more apt to throw up just all kind of where those nerves and things happen, but they get nauseated and they get vomit, they'll start to vomit. Labored breathing, they have dyspnea, they can't breathe, sweating, anxiety, and they're pale, cool, and dusky. They don't look good. And you can tell that they're not oxygenating and something's on, that impending doom and anxiety. They're scared and it is scary. So an interesting thing is they're silent MIs. There are people out there that have heart attacks that don't even know they have a heart attack. They'll come in and get an EKG from the doctor's office and all of a sudden they'll go, you've had a heart attack. And they're like, no way. And so they'll go and get a cath done and see you know, what's going on. These are usually mild heart attacks, but they can be deadly. Diabetics are the ones that we see. So diabetics have peripheral neuropathy, but we have neuropathy, so we don't always feel pain. Diabetics will not feel pain like a normal individual, especially those that have been diabetics for a very long time or uncontrolled diabetics. So that damage has been done. They don't, they don't feel the symptoms of what's happening. So if they present and they're diaphoretic and anxious and feeling this pain, then it's gotta be worse than what you even would think like if they just came and said i just started having chest pain but they're a, a brittle diabetic you need to think this is not good because they didn't feel the, the beginning parts and now we're at this part women too women present very differently and that's been something that's been a problem with our um culture and medical society is with women we present a little bit differently we don't always present with classic signs we're not going to come in always with the chest crushing chest pain radiating down the left arm and jaw pain said we might have right elbow pain or we'll be just feeling very anxious with just um, a little bit of discomfort here and there or i had a lady present once and she went to the dentist numerous times over this tooth pain she kept having the dentist kept saying there's nothing wrong with your teeth and finally he said you're just gonna have to go to your doctor because i can't find anything wrong she went to her doctor and she had had a heart attack that's what she was having so she ended up going in and getting stents placed at, at the cath lab so there's just those different kinds of presentations and we seem to see it with women and diabetics don't feel pain so that's why but always obtain your ekg because it will speak volumes because it's going to show you what's going on the symptoms might not so diagnostics, always, always, always EKG first. Get that EKG and take it to the doctor or the healthcare provider to read. They should be able to interpret the cardiologist if this patient's actually having a heart attack. Don't hold on to it, don't lay it down, don't hesitate, don't go see another patient. As soon as that EKG is in hand, take it to see. Time is tissue. Every second and minute counts that can save this patient's life. And so you wanna be on it. ST elevation equals heart attack, death to cardiac tissue. If we see on the EKG ST elevation, that is indicative of a heart attack. Higher the elevation, we call it tombstoning. If they go all the way real high, they make tombstones, and that is a severe heart attack, and lots of time death will occur to the patient. So we want to be on it. If we can intervene before we get to death of tissue, we can have ischemia, which is ST depression. And if that's the case, then what happens is we can intervene, blood flow will return to that area, and the tissue is damaged, but it's not dead. So it has to take time to heal. So we have to give the patient that time to rest and let the heart heal. And so they can come back and actually change their lifestyle and do okay but we need to make sure that we know ST elevation and that's an actual heart attack and ST depression is ischemia. 
We do labs. You could do a CK, CK, MB, but the lab of choice is troponin. Over 0 0.5 indicates trauma to the heart muscle. So we are thinking heart attack. So we want we would look at that and it's going then to say for fact we are having a heart attack, which gives us the green light to go to the cath lab. Negative troponin happens sometimes though. And when that happens, we know that there's some issue going on. Do they have some blockage and it's kind of, they're getting some perfusion, but they're not, they're not actually having a heart attack. And if that's the case, a stress test, either physical, get on the treadmill and start walking, or a nuclear chemical stress test. If that's the case, we want to do these, if whatever they can handle. If they're doing a, a um, stress test on the treadmill, um, they need to be MPO. We don't want to have any medicines that are going to cause vasodilation. We want to hold all of that to see what the heart's actually going to do. We also want to hold any caffeine or stimulants or nicotine, nothing, because we need to know what's happening with the heart. Same with the chemical. We avoid caffeine and nicotine and any stimulant, but any time in this, if there's chest pain, we stop the test immediately and then we let the physician know. So time is tissue, like I said. And so we, if we, we need to get in and we need to intervene. If there's a blockage, we've got to open the blockage. So we can go into the cath lab and do an angioplasty. That's where we go in through the groin and sometimes the, the um, wrist and um, we can go up, feed a catheter up into the heart, and we can either put a stent, which is a wiry looking thing that goes along the side of the walls of the artery to open it, or we can use a PCI balloon to smash the, the actual plaque or whatever up against the walls of the artery to open. And lots of times what they'll do is go in and balloon open, smash it up there, open it up and then put a stent in to hold it open so that it doesn't reocclude. One of the things with any acute MIs, after they have one and they go to have anything done, they'll go to the ICU. And the reason is, is they need to be monitored carefully because the first 24 hours post MI is the highest risk of reocclusion. So they could reocclude and have a massive and not make it. And it happens sometimes. Um, if we can't fix it in the cath lab, we go to the OR and have a cabbage, which is a coronary artery bypass graft. Take grafts from the, um, you can take grafts from yourself, usually vessels from the lower legs, and they can go in and they'll bypass around the bat. They just take it and go around it and sew it in and make that happen. You can have different, some people have four bypasses. It just depends on what's going on. Usually the cabbage piece is done if this cannot be done at all. So they'll say either the disease is too bad or they have too much and they need an open heart. They need open heart surgery, coronary artery bypass grafts done. Um, if you don't get that done, sometimes they'll come in and do an endarterectomy and that's where they go in directly and remove the clot. It could be a big old fatty clot and they're going to go in and just take it out and they cut it out and do what they have to do and then patch it up and they'll come to the, the ICU and be watched. But normally they go home and within 24 hours once that procedure is done. The other thing is if we can't get you to somewhere to get this done quickly, we can give thrombolytics or clock clot busters, TPA or streptokinase. And we'll talk a little more about that here in a second. So we have always learned that Mona, which is what we give for um, heart attacks, it's morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and aspirin. But I wanted to share with you the way they want it to be given is, no way of saying it, it's like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like I'm saying something else. But anyway, it's oxygen, aspirin, nitrates, and morphine, and that's the order we want to give them. Nitroglycerin, glycerin, you knew, is a vasodilator. It's a, it's a systemic vasodilator. It's going to open up. It decreases workload of the heart. And if there is a blockage, if you have some blockage and you open the vessel, you hopefully will open it enough so blood flow can get through and you can maintain that tissue to perfuse enough to keep it going or alive until you can intervene. Um, the next thing is with nitroglycerin, it's sublingual. We want to give it sublingual under the tongue. You need three doses to be given. You can give up to three doses. 
every five minutes. They're five minutes apart, sublingual. But the thing that you want to remember is you take your first dose. It should have a little kind of burn under the tongue. People say it kind of tingles, a tingling under the tongue. Usually means it's working. It doesn't necessarily have to, but most of the time it does. And so one of the things you always want to do is if you come on scene or you're helping someone you love, look at the expiration date on those little vials. Um, the uh, five minutes apart, if they're still having pain, they can take a second dose and they need to call EMS at that time. EMS needs to be en route. If they've got to take two nitros, it's time to go and get checked out. They can have up to three. Um, one thing I do want you to know is if you take nitroglycerin, it's a systemic vasodilator, no Viagra. It's another systemic vasodilator. And what will happen is they will be severely hypotensive and we don't need that to happen. So FYI, something to teach people, especially elderly men or you know men that need to take Viagra and females take it too nowadays, um, they need to not take nitro with that. Real quick story. Abby, um, is that I uh, had a patient and he started having chest pain watching football on a weekend, gets up, goes, walks over to his neighbor's house and said, hey, do you have any nitroglycerin? I'm having some chest pain. Well, he knew that this gentleman had heart issues and had nitro. And, and this neighbor said, yeah, here, and gave him this little bottle and took the bottle and he took one pill, put it under his tongue, walked back over to the house, sat down, was watching football, Pain's still going, getting worse. So instead of calling 911 at that point, he gets up, walks back to the neighbor, takes a second nitroglycerin, and comes back to the house, and the pain is getting to where he's short of breath, anxious, all of these things. So he decides to call 911. They come on scene, and they said, okay, when did your chest pain? What have you been doing? So the whole time he's exerting himself, right? We're walking, exerting, which caused more demand on the heart. We're taking nitro that's not our own, not been prescribed to ourselves. And when the EMS guys looked at the nitro vial, because the neighbor came over with it, it was totally expired, so it wasn't working. And so he lived to tell the story, but OMG, get to the hospital, guys. Teach people to do it. Morphine will relieve the chest pain. Um, If you have, this sounds weird, I typed it quickly, but you, it's for chest pain, it should relieve chest pain. If you're still having chest pain after morphine, you're usually having a heart attack. It's not gonna relieve the pain if you're actively occluding and not getting that. You're gonna still have chest pain, but it does help and it can help with anxiety. Oxygen, we wanna definitely put some oxygen on. SATs will be fine, um, but this will help because there's an oxygen demand. It's an increase in oxygen, oxygen due to what's going on with the heart. And then aspirin, a lot of people go, oh, it's a blood thinner, it's a whatever. It is actually, it makes the blood cells slick. So they stop clump, clumping or clotting the red blood cells. So if you have red blood cells and you give aspirin, it kind of coats and they just can slide on by instead of forming clots all up in there. So definitely 325 milligrams aspirin. If they've taken a baby aspirin, you can go ahead and give them more baby aspirin to equal 325. 81 milligrams is a baby aspirin. Know that dose. 325 is a normal dose aspirin. So um, we want to give a full meal deal. And if they can't take it because they're nauseated and vomiting, we can give it up the hiney. And it is a protocol. We will give a rectal suppository, aspirin. So clot busters, thrombolytics or fibro, uh, fibrinolytics, should have an S there, sorry, is TPA and streptokinase. These are big bombs. We give them because we can't get you to get a procedure done. Let's just say weather is down you live up on the top of a mountain and we need to get you to a hospital there's no way in 45 minutes we'll be able to drive you down and get you around and to the to a actual facility that can help and we can't because weather fly you so if that's the case tpa or streptokinase might be the the answer or what the protocol they go with to try to bust up the clot once it's given um you can have arrhythmias with this because it's going to start to break the clot up and so flow will come and you can start to have different arrhythmias so we want to definitely have the patient monitored it's a high high bleeding risk guys with this stuff so we do not want to start a new iv we do not want to give injections do any kind of lab stick with them once this is given because they can truly bleed 
um, to where it's an issue. We need to give it into something that we can hold pressure on. So we always give it in a peripheral IV, that's what that PIV is, and not a central line for that very reason. So medications, we've talked about Mona, you need to know all of those. A nitroglycerin, remember, will decrease the workload of the heart, it's a vasodilator. Um, but heparin is another one we give. Now heparin, a lot of people go, oh, it's a blood thinner. Please, from this point on, after this lecture, do not refer to any of those medications as blood thinners. They're not thinning anything. It's an anticoagulant. It's preventing clotting from happening. So that's what it is, and we want to give it so that we prevent any further clotting or any other clotting that could be going on in the body. Um, we want to check a lab value, PTT 46 to 70 is what we where we should be and the antidote if we have too if we have too much heparin on board and we're bleeding because we can cause head bleeds and everything else from this is protamine sulfate and i want you to know that that's what we give that's the antidote for heparin remember if we're giving any anticoagulants we need to worry about bleeding soft bristle to uh soft bristle toothbrushes shaving um, if they bumped their arms or hit something like the side of a table on their leg or anything a week ago and they start to take any anticoagulant, these bruises can start to show up. So you need to be able to tell the client or the patient this because they're going to be like, oh my gosh, where did all these bruises come from? What happened to me? Well, it's from the anticoagulant and they need to understand that. So complications of an acute MI, cardiogenic shock dysrhythmias, VFib or VTAC. Now I know you haven't lo learned a lot about rhythms, but these are rhythms that I will um, show you some strips, but um, VFib is not good. It's like a little and VTAC is the and we can have pulseless VTAC or a VTAC with a pulse. If it's with a pulse, we do not shock it. If it's without a pulse, we shock it. So um, heart failure is another complication of an acute MI. And we want to give diuretics for this. This is where the Lasix, the furosemides, all the ites are going to come into play. And the thing we want to watch for is a rapid weight gain, crackles, worsening crackles, JVD, jugular vein distension, and maybe a new S3 heart sound. These are signs that you're going into heart failure. Um, and we already talked about cardiogenic shock. It's a pump issue. So if I have an MI, that muscle's been damaged, so my pump isn't pumping right it's damaged and so what do we need to do we support it we can use balloon pumps and other things to rest the heart we give medications to help decrease the workload of the heart so the heart can heal so one of the things that can happen is we can get pericarditis that's inflammation of the pericardial sac that goes around the heart if that happens you get this kind of sandpaper rub sound when you're listening to heart tones but if it gets bad enough, what can happen is it can create a cardiac tamponade. It just gets fluid buildup or whatever, and it will hold the heart. The heart is being enclosed by the sac full of fluid, or if it gets so flat and hardened, it can't move. It can't pump effectively. And if that's the case, it's called a cardiac tamponade. The way we have to fix it because the heart pump's got to pump again, right? So inflammation in the sac around the heart can cause this. The, it can stop the heart from beating due to that kind of sealing it off. JVD, extreme JVD, this jugular vein distension, low blood pressure, they'll become hypotensive and we'll have muffled heart tones. So when you're listening to heart tones, you're not really hearing. It's hard, hard to hear. Um, sometimes what happens too is if we have blunt trauma and we learn that we can have a cardiac tamponade and that sac will fill up with blood if that's the case a big long needle is inserted and we draw the blood off the physician will do it draw the blood off it's usually a cardiovascular thoracic surgeon and they can do this at bedside to save someone's life but they can draw off that blood and as soon as that is the sac is relieved of whatever's causing the problem the heart will just start to beat like it should and you have no issues so an acute MI, what do we have to do? We need to change our way of life, guys. If someone has a heart attack, they've got to change their way of life. Diet change, they need a DASH diet. Um, they need low fluid, they don't need to pack on the fluids, they need to watch it, and low sodium. Um, two grams 
uh, sodium and two um, liters of fluid a day, and that's it. Um, based on your book is what we'll go with, and I need to look it up, but the majority of all of the um, resources out there, it's two grams, two liters, just FYI, something close to that. We need to decrease it. Daily weights, looking for an increase in weight. And I put that because I want you to understand when I'm weighing someone daily, I'm not looking for weight loss. Now, every day I get on the scale and I'm looking for weight loss, not happening. But for heart issues or anybody with congestive heart failure, heart failure, um, anybody with any kind of um, acute MI, we're worried about them going into failure, we're going to weigh them every day looking for an increase. Because if there's an increase, we're, we're holding on to fluid. Meaning then we need to decrease intake of fluid. We need, of course, wherever salt goes, fluid goes. We need to decrease the sodium and lots of times give that diuretic and pull it off so they can urinate it off. No caffeine. Caffeine is a vasoconstrictor. So if I constrict those vessel downs, my heart's got to work that much harder to pump. We don't need that. No nicotine. Same thing. It's scarring and causing hardening of those arteries. No nicotine. It's a bad deal. No alcohol. It just does not do well also with the heart. Low cholesterol. Watch your animal products. Dairy. Low fat. We need to be consuming low fat. Um, exercise at least 30 minutes for five days a week. Anybody that has suffered from an acute MI won't just go start out there jogging around the corner. They need to go to cardiac rehab and they will start to watch, they'll watch them very carefully, watch their heart and their blood pressure, their heart rate and blood pressure, respiratory rate, and they will start to build them to where they can walk without any issues and all that. They allow the heart to heal and then start to strengthen that muscle. And that's what cardiac rehab does. But once they're done with that in their home, they need to start to walk or do something 30 minutes, swim, something five days a week. So they need to figure it out. No sex until you can walk two flights of stairs without being in that short of breath. And so that needs to happen. And so that is one thing because we see people that come in with 30 and 40 year olds with heart attacks, something we need to tell them because they go home and of course they have needs and their loved ones have needs and so they don't need to be jumping in the bed this could cause them to have a massive coronary so that's a big no-no so a couple other things that i want you to know is how to i want them to avoid ibuprofen it increases the risk for clots um, it can cause bleeding issues too, but um, avoid ibuprofen. They don't need to be taking NSAIDs over the counter. They're going to probably be given ARBs or ACEs or both. Um, they're usually used post MI. Beta blockers are loved by cardiac. Um, they are great because they play upon that beta one, and so it will help um, relax and um, help decrease blood pressure and um, the heart muscle itself statins they're going to lower the cholesterol and one thing i wanted to, you've learned about statins before go back pull that drug card or go look that drug back up but one thing remember no grapefruit juice no grapefruits no grapefruit juice with statins um and then they're going to probably take an aspirin baby aspirin every day for the rest of their life and or aspirin and plavix so um they or and there's other eloquis is out there now there's some others but um, these will help prevent further any clotting, uh, them from having any clotting or hopefully prevent any more acute MIs. They need it because there's something going on. So this helps just keeps things moving along. But that will make them, when they take, especially the Eliquis or Plavix, they're at a higher risk of bleeding. And we need to always explain that. So if they fall and hit their head, they're in an accident of any form, they need to be make sure they tell someone so that they can scan them and make sure they're not having a head bleed. So this is kind of just down and dirty about acute MI. And um, I want you to go through the reading and I want you to use this. So we'll be doing a, a test review for this section too. So I hope this helps.